Hey guys, welcome back to Range of Survival and Fieldcraft. I'm Andrew. Now what I have for you today is a video on 10 military winter survival skills. We're going to do skills ranging from sheltercraft, fire, food procurement, tool improvisation, as well as water, all out in a winter environment. These are skills taught in survival as well as improvisational techniques that we can use in the field to accommodate for our survival needs. So sit back, relax. Like and subscribe, leave a comment down below, and let's get started. All right, who wants to build a snowman? Now in a winter environment, we're gonna use the snow as a shelter material because it's typically plentiful and we can use it to make a wide variety of shelters. We could use natural material from the area if we can find it, such as grass, barks, different pieces of material, wood, twigs, and sticks to construct a shelter and get out of the elements. But most often in winter survival, those items are going to be covered by snow and they're going to be a lot of work to actually gather those items as opposed to just carving into the snow and making some sort of shelter in the snow to get out of the elements. Using the snow, we need to provide for the most basic survival needs. That being thermoregulation, hydration, and protection. We want to make sure our shelter can be warm and we can stay warm inside that shelter and not go hypothermic. We want to make sure that we can hydrate. We can boil snow if we have a small stove or if we need to start a fire to get water. And then we need to protect ourselves from the elements getting out of the wind and cold temperatures to maintain thermoregulation and stay hydrated through our survival ordeal. But with the snow, we can take our saw and start cutting away into a drift, gather our shovel, and then start moving large blocks of snow out of our way to dig into that drift and then get below that drift. We can use the saw and shovel again to start carving in and creating what's called a snow cave. The snow cave is a very simple shelter concept. We find that large drift and just begin digging into that drift and underneath it in the snow. That way we're out of the wind, we're protected, we can get somewhere warm and boil water from snow, melting it in our stove to provide for our hydration. So this is a perfect shelter. It's gonna take a lot, a lot of work, but it is efficient as long as we have the tools to start carving the shelter and getting in there to get out of the elements and survive in winter survival. Now the snow cave is a very good survival shelter in a winter environment. We just want to be cautious of the type of snow we dig into. I waited for a few days for the sun and temperatures to go up, melt some of the snow, and then for the temperatures to drop back down so the snow actually froze and is a tougher consistency. We've got at least a foot or so of a rooftop thickness of snow, and then we've got enough length inside of our snow shelter to get completely inside. We can grab more snow if we need to and actually plug up this entrance and leave only the top open if we wanted to. That way we avoid some of the wind and nastier temperatures. But we have a candle lit. That candle gives off about the same heat as a human body. So it's like two people in here with me and the candle. And then we've got our stove and we're melting snow for a hot drink to stay hydrated and stay warm inside this shelter. So this is a very good shelter for survival, especially in a winter environment. And then one of the last safety features that we should probably install is going to be some sort of safety line. We always want to sleep head toward the opening of our snow shelter. Reason being is that if this collapses in the night, our head is closest to the exit so we can at least attempt to dig ourselves out and continue to get oxygen and avoid suffocating in our snow cave. That would be a bad thing. But a safety feature we can install is getting a piece of cordage and attaching it to our snow shovel, planting that snow shovel firmly in the snow drift outside of our shelter, bringing that line into our shelter, and then either tying it to our wrist or to a piece of clothing. That way, if this does collapse, we can at least grab that cordage and attempt to pull ourselves and kick ourselves free of our snow shelter and get out to safety and avoid suffocating or being trapped and freezing to death in our snow cave.
fire is going to be the number one thing to keep us warm out in a winter survival environment. We have limited ability to go after wild food in the form of foraging because so many of the plants are dead or we can't find them underneath the snow. We also have a limited capacity or ability to go after wild game because a lot of the game that is out in winter time can freely move over the snow faster than we can walk. We also have a decreased ability to stay warm with metabolic function from eating food or exercise because it is so cold we're often going to be stuck in one place at one time for an extended period of time. So fire is going to be incredibly important. One thing we can do with fire is get creative and get fire up out of the snow to make it sustainable and long lasting or to use it for an immediate purpose getting warm, cooking food, boiling water, and even signaling for rescue. But fire is going to be that quintessential skill out in a winter survival environment that needs to be mastered and needs to be practiced routinely, especially during cold hours, to make it perfect, get it right, so we can survive when we actually need it. Now, another military winter survival tip was something that was developed in World War II, the Swedish torch. Now, this is actually Finnish in its design and application, Finnish soldiers used this during World War II to cook on as well as stay warm and boil water from the surrounding area. This is a very simple application. All we do is take a large log to use as fuel. We split it twice into four different sections and we take our kindling and our fuel material and we place it in between those splits. We can use wire or paracord or some sort of lash to actually keep this torch together or simply pack it in the snow if we have a long enough log. But now all we have to do is put our tinder on top with a little bit more fuel and kindling, light it, and then it will feed itself. The embers will fall down in through those splits we've made and the log will begin to burn and create that torch effect. And now that our stove is properly lit, we just take our bush pot full of snow place it right on top and let our stove cook. So in my last video, I had a lot of questions about my Arctic necklace. And basically what the Arctic necklace is, is just taking a survival tin kit like this and taking the best items out of it that we can attach to a necklace and then wear around our person. The Arctic necklace is a take on survival kits other individuals have used where we take items, put them on a piece of 550 cord or a chain and hang them around our neck. This is so we always have a survival kit on us, but we also keep these items warm next to our body. That way they function and give us a little bit of an advantage if our dexterity and mental acuity is decreased as a result of surviving in cold climates. As part of our Arctic necklace survival kit, we have a lighter with duct tape and then rubber bands to start fires. We have a ferro rod with a striker, a chem light, a small one for signaling at nighttime. We have chapstick wrapped with tape and then cotton tucked away in the cap for fire lighting as well as hygiene. We have a whistle for signaling, a small metal signaling mirror that will stay in one piece and won't break apart on us. We have a flashlight with a strobe setting for signaling during hours of limited visibility as well as a small utility knife for everyday tasks. The Arctic Necklace Survival Kit gives us the ability to do a wide variety of things, everything from starting fire to signaling for rescue at nighttime with our buzzsaw or our flashlight and with our whistle and our signaling mirror. And then we can also take care of ourselves using that chapstick or lip balm. It's a good kit to have on your person out in the winter. Snowshoes give us the ability to move over terrain in a winter environment a lot easier than if we didn't have snowshoes to begin with. If we didn't have snowshoes, 
we would be burning through calories and hydration and exhausting ourselves by post holing into the snow, crawling over snow, and putting ourselves in a more dangerous situation in which our hydration, our thermoregulation, and our protection is compromised by trying to make it through the snow. So having snowshoes is incredibly important, it gives us the ability to move fast and efficiently in the snow. Snowshoes, an obvious piece of kit in a snowy environment. These help us walk, help us save energy, help us to prevent overexerting ourselves. It is very easy, especially in a cold weather environment, wearing a lot of clothing to overexert yourself and become a heat injury. But these snowshoes, especially surplus ones like these, can also help us get a fire going. These magnesium snowshoes, military surplus style, are great tools to have. You can pick them up at surplus stores or possibly at flea markets, but they're made of magnesium. Magnesium is a highly resistant metal. It will not take the amount of cold temperatures as other metals, which makes it easier to work with, and it'll get warmer faster. But we can take this magnesium, make shavings out of it, collect those pile of shavings, and then with our ferro rod or another fire lighting device, we can ignite the magnesium shavings to get a fire going. Now, as another military survival tip, it's going to require our canteen. Now that we have our hole dug, we can fill up our canteen. We only want to fill it up about two-thirds to three-fourths full in this canteen because we're going to need that space for later. All right, so we got our canteen cup and we've got our canteen. Luckily, this is a clear canteen, so you'll be able to see the trick. Now, what we're gonna do is take our canteen with our water about two thirds of the way full, make sure the lid is tight. We're gonna turn it upside down. All we're gonna do is place it right inside our canteen cup and we're gonna leave this thing out overnight to freeze. Now, this is a simple skill that anyone who spent time outside, especially in winter environments where there's snow and some freezing temperatures, can understand. If we have containers and we're not using those enclosed containers for warming bottles at night to go in our sleeping bag, or we're not packing them away to safeguard and protect them, or we can't for some reason, we have to do this while we leave our canteen and canteen cup out overnight to ensure that we have readily available water in the morning. All right, so we let our canteen sit out overnight to freeze. Reason being is that we turn it upside down. That way, the majority of the ice collects at what is the bottom of our canteen. So when we flip it over, we've got water sitting at the top of our canteen that we can get to without having to chip away at it through that ice, taking a chance on ruining our canteen. And we have water at the top readily available that we can pour into our canteen cup and make a hot drink. Now, another reason that we have our canteen cup only two thirds or three quarters of the way full of water, and we turn it upside down not only to get that water, but we have the air at the top of our canteen here. The water as it freezes is going to expand. And so if we leave enough air in the bottom of our canteen, the ice can freely expand without actually damaging our canteen that way we have a safe canteen that we can access in the morning if we fill this whole thing up with water and let it freeze overnight it will crack and break the canteen and then we are out of a water container now besides our arctic bag melting snow with our body heat to get water 
and our bush pot, just putting that pot over top of our Swedish torch and fire to melt snow to get a drink. There is another cheap, easy method to melt snow with just a small piece of kit that we can carry with us in any survival situation. And that lightweight, cheap, easy item that we can carry in any survival situation in any kit that is portable, compact, and go with us anywhere that we can use to actually melt some more snow to get a drink out here in the winter is a mosquito net. Now that we have our fire going, we can take this opportunity not only to melt snow in our bush pot, we can also use a little trick. Our mosquito net that we may have with us as part of our kit can be used to also melt snow. Don't worry, this one is not treated with any DEET or insect repellent. It is just the netting itself. So we can put snow inside this, suspend it over our canteen cup or another container and collect the melted snow, which will turn into water for more drinks. Now, even in winter survival, water is still going to be a very important survival priority. Luckily for us, the water is everywhere in the form of snow and ice and there are ways that we can actually take that snow or ice and convert it into water safely for consumption to keep us hydrated. One of the easiest ways we can actually get that water is through something called an arctic bag. Just like this. This type of technique is great for anybody going outside, especially in the winter time. This is something that can be easily carried inside of a pocket, or we can just have the contents for the Arctic bag on our person or as part of our kit, especially as ancillary items for our survival kit. All we need is just a plastic bag, some tape that could be wrapped around a lighter or some other object, and some 550 cord. Very simple. We just take that duct tape and we wrap the entire quart size bag with duct tape. The reason we do this is to protect the bag from any other objects out in the wilderness or any objects or tools that we might carry on our person. That way the bag is protected and we don't puncture the bag. This way we can keep the water in the bag and if we use this bag and have to put it in between clothing and around our person, the bag does not leak on our person or get our clothing wet, compromising our warmth in that dead air space in our clothing. So we have this bag, a very simple tool to know. Now with our Arctic bag complete, we wear it around our neck with that piece of 550 cord, just like a necklace. But with this bag, we can now go out, we can find snow like this that is undisturbed, completely white, and then actually collect this snow. We want to stay away from snow that is disturbed, has animal scat, stay away from the yellow snow that is not lemon flavor, and we want to find snow that is pure white. If there's a red sheen or discoloration on top of the snow, that means there's probably mold growing on top of the snow or some sort of bacteria. We can move that snow away to get at the white snow underneath, but we want to find the best white snow that we can. Then we just fill our bag up. We can place it inside our coat to use our body temperature to actually melt that snow and get a drink. Now, the important thing to remember doing a technique like this with this Arctic bag melting snow or ice with our own body heat is that we don't want this bag directly next to our skin. We want to put a few layers of clothing, if possible, between this bag and our outer layer while still using our body heat to melt that snow inside. So what we can do, add another layer of clothing underneath our waterproof layer outside, like this fleece jacket. We take our bag and simply tuck it inside between that fleece and our outer jacket, and then zip it up. And now we can use our body heat to start melting that snow without lowering our core body temperature and putting us in a dangerous situation 
out in a cold weather environment. And then soon enough, we can check on that bag to see if there's any water collected and consume that water to stay hydrated. One thing that's really important in a cold weather environment, especially one like the one we're in today where there's snow on the ground, is eye protection. We need to have eye protection to avoid snow blindness, which is the sun's rays reflecting off of the snow and burning the interior of our eye, the retina. So we need to have eye protection. If we don't have sunglasses like this, we can make some and protect our eyes for survival. The sun goggles or snow goggles here are used to prevent the amount of light reflecting off of the snow getting into our eyes. This is a technique that has been used for generations, especially with the Inuit and northern peoples in colder climates that take these snow goggles or sun goggles and carve them from natural materials and even from animal bone. That way the aperture of the eye is reduced mechanically through these goggles to prevent the reflection of that sunlight from entering the eye and burning the retina. This is a very helpful thing to know out in a winter environment with a lot of snow on the ground and with bright sunny days. That way we protect our eyes and maintain our health because we're going to need those eyes to search, find food, find water, land navigate, and signal for rescue and get out of the survival situation that we placed ourselves in. As you can see, it's very easy to make these, especially if we have the equipment available. But we can make sun goggles or snow goggles like these out of just about anything. Tree bark, plant fibers, we can make it from a piece of plastic, trash that's left out. But we used 100 mile an hour tape right here with 550 cord from our military kit. And now we have sun goggles or snow goggles to help reduce the amount of glare coming from the sun off the snow into our eyes and help protect our eyes straight thugging, no hugging. Improvisation is the key to survival. We got to think outside the box and something we're taught and things we come up with out in the field if we're creative enough and have enough time out in the field is thinking about and using things that we wouldn't suspect have alternate purposes in different ways. One of the things we can do is harvest a Y branch from the sticks available and then with a bungee cord, some zip ties or 550 cord or some other lashing material as well as some 100 mile an hour tape or duct tape and some slingshot ammo is come up with an improvised slingshot. We can take that Y section, harvest it from the field, and then using zip ties with our bungee cord, attach that bungee cord to the frame of our slingshot. That bungee cord could be from our camp craft material or from a basic survival kit or out of the back of a car. But we can take that bungee cord, lash it to our slingshot, with improvised methods like zip ties or with paracord and then finding the middle of that slingshot we just cut it we can form a knot a simple overhand knot on both ends that we just cut from the middle of that bungee cord and then taking duct tape or 100 mile an hour tape we create a pocket for our slingshot we need to double up that tape and reinforce the connecting points of that pocket with the bungee cord bands to make sure it's strong enough when we pull on that slingshot that it's not going to fall apart on us. But once we have that together, we can grab slingshot ammo or small rocks, anything around the area, and actively hunt for animals that are going to still be out in wintertime. Small rabbits or snowshoe hares are going to be out, as well as ptarmigans or pheasants, or sometimes turkeys and larger animals that we can go after, collect that game once we kill it dispatch it and then bring it back to camp and we have some food. Another skill that is incredibly important is the ability to signal. Nobody gives a crap about signaling until it's time to signal. But we can use fire to signal as well in addition to other signaling devices we may have with us. Panels, flares, signaling mirror, whistle, whatever. We can take a fire like this, make a big fire, put out our panel and then alert search and rescue aircraft once they fly over. Or we can take three fires, put them in a triangle roughly 10 meters apart, and then our signal panel in the center to alert search and rescue aircraft that we're in distress and that we need help. Now signaling 
like I said, is going to be one of the most important survival priorities. It's possibly more important in a winter survival scenario because it is 10 times harder to move around. It is going to be hard to find food from natural sources, especially wild game and foraging for food because everything is covered by snow and there are going to be limited animals out to possibly hunt. So having a robust signaling kit as part of our survival kit is important, especially in winter survival. Oftentimes we can use the snow to our advantage to color, contrast, and movement with our signal kit to alert search and rescue aircraft because large orange panels and signals such as fires or SOS markers will be contrasted against the white snow visibly from an aerial view where aircraft can actually see those signals and then locate the survivor and rescue the survivor. Plus, in a winter environment, the elements are against us because it is so cold and so hard to move and so hard to do anything in a winter environment without the necessary tools that we could take a chance and compromise our clothing, compromise ourselves by remaining unprotected, dehydrated, and then lowering our core body temperature out in the elements, putting us in a world of hurt. And so signaling is going to be very, very important for the survivor. Here what we can do is just a basic signal that will work very well, especially during hours of limited visibility. We can construct three fires in a triangle or a V-shape, as well as use one of our visual markers or panels to construct this basic signal anything of three in the wilderness is a dead giveaway that somebody needs help we construct three fires light them place the panel in the center and then try to get the attention of search and rescue aircraft using signaling mirrors and any other signaling devices we may have at our disposal to get rescued in this situation all right guys that does it for this video a down and dirty 10 skills for military winter survival winter is a challenging time to survive and it would behoove us to study the concepts and go out and practice them in a safe environment as often as possible. But I hope you like this video. If you did like this video, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave me a comment in the comment section. I always appreciate your feedback. I want to thank you guys for everything you do for me, for your likes, your views, your subscriptions, your comments, your feedback, and your shares. And I'll be back with another video as soon as I can, guys. Thanks.